Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for CBM's year-end tax planning and market update webinar. Uh, this is going to be a one-hour session, and it's hosted by CBM and May Barnhart Investments, CBM's wealth advisory subsidiary. I'd like to especially welcome those of you who have not been with CBM before. Uh, we are a full-service tax accounting and advisory firm uh, based in the D.C. metro area, but serving clients in uh, up and down the eastern seaboard, mid-Atlantic, nationally even. Um, so welcome for, to join, for joining us. Uh, our presenters today are uh, Richard Morris and Gregory Estes. And the, uh, the goal of today's presentation is to really ensure that you're taking advantage of all the year-end tax strategies that may be available to you, and then also to share an overview of current market conditions, uh, which is part of the expertise that we share with our MBI clients. Uh, I would encourage you to visit uh, May Barnhart Investments uh, for more information. Uh, that's where Greg and, and his team have their information uh, available. Uh, after today's session, you'll receive a copy of, uh, today, of the slides and a recording of the presentation. Uh, for those of you who submitted questions during the registration process, those have been sent on to the presenters and they will be shared and integrated into the presentation over the next hour or so. But if anything does come up that you do have a question about, please feel free to use the chat box. I have a feeling Richard and Greg will probably concentrate, first of all, on the core content of the presentation, and then towards the end, they'll get to the Q&A, uh, but they are monitoring it, so they will respond to any questions uh, that you have. And for those of you who are interested in receiving CPE for today's session, I'll be launching a series of polls over the next hour. So to be eligible for CPE, please respond to three of the four polls. Let me launch one uh, right now so you can see what it looks like. Um, so on the screen, on your screen or in the chat box, a little poll I should have popped up. Uh, please just click yes and then hit submit and then we'll be able to record your entry. Uh, if you don't need CPE, then please disregard that part of the, uh, the program. Uh, also, in the last couple of minutes of the presentation, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave a little link in the chat box, which is a link to a short evaluation form. If you wouldn't mind taking a minute or two to fill out the survey, it really helps us understand how our education is being received and also gives you an opportunity to uh, you know, propose different topics for future webinars. Okay, so let me quickly go over who our presenters are, their background, and I'm going to turn it over to them. Uh, Richard Morris is a partner and the director of CBM's tax practice. He has more than 35 years of public accounting experience working with closely held businesses, uh, their owners and executives. Uh, he also has extensive experience in estate, trust, corporate, individual and partnership taxation and specializes in working with clients with unusual or complex tax circumstances. Uh, Richard speaks on new developments and strategies for corporate and individual taxation, including year end tax planning, as well as federal and state tax developments. Uh, he also works with clients and the local community to navigate the economic changes that result from tax changes and economic policies from the COVID-19 pandemic, such as the CARES Act. Uh, he was also quoted twice by the Washington Business Journal on the Paycheck Protection uh, Program Loan Forgiveness Program. Uh, Gregory Estes uh, is a Senior Portfolio and Relationship Manager at May Barnhart Investments. Uh, he has nearly 30 years of building successful client relationships, uh, managing portfolios, developing client investment strategies, performing equity research, and leading compliance-based risk management strategies. Uh, he helps to oversee the wealth management goals of MBI's high net worth clients by cultivating relationships and providing customized research analysis and informed guidance. Uh, he's also a chartered financial analyst uh, one of the industry's highest distinctions in the investment management profession. So I'd like to welcome you all again this morning. I'm going to turn it over now to our presenters. Well, thank you very much, Joe. Um, so I'm going to spend a few minutes kind of giving you a, a market update. And I thought I'd start off with a, a little bit of humor um, in salute of our recently expired Thanksgiving holiday. There's really two themes in the cartoons uh, that most people are concerned about, businesses are concerned about, the government's concerned about, and that's inflation, and then the government's response to inflation. So consumers obviously are, are very concerned about food inflation. Now the, the Federal Reserve, which is has a primary task of controlling inflation, maybe they're not as concerned about food inflation. When they look, uh, for example, at consumer price indexes and personal consumption expenditures to monitor inflation, 
they always talk about core inflation, which excludes food and energy because those are too volatile. But for you and for me, those are they're very real. But the larger point stands. Inflation has been a big issue. So the Federal Reserve is tasked with taking care of inflation, like making that a, an important component of their dual mandate for employment and price stability. That second, uh, if you're not familiar with who Jay Powell is, he's the Federal Reserve Chairman. And essentially, the Federal Reserve controls monetary policy, which is the supply of dollars in the economy and the price of dollars by raising interest rates. And by raising interest rates, they, they apply basically a break to the economy so that they can reduce inflation. And the idea here, and this is this is a narrative that we'll be talking about. And when I talk about narratives, I'm talking about working theories that explain markets and that investors use as rules of thumb to understand where the market is and where it's going. Well, one of these narratives is the idea of the soft landing. The Federal Reserve is, has raised interest rates with the idea of curbing the economy to the point that it reduces inflation. Because when the, when the economy is running hot, it makes it hard to reduce inflation. So in this scenario, the soft landing is you, you reduce economic performance just enough to get inflation back to the happy zone that I'll show you later on, which is a 2% inflation rate, um, so that you don't really cause a big recession. So we'll see whether that can happen, but the, the soft landing is definitely a working theory. But shifting away from monetary policy to fiscal policy on the, on the next page, I'm going to take a moment to talk about fiscal policy, which is really controlled by Congress and by extension, the administration. Specifically, government shutdowns, which which have been an issue in recent history, and we've avoided too, uh, most recently over the past couple of months. Um, the idea behind shutdowns and how they impact the markets, and this has been studied by academics, it's more on the front end. So markets are more volatile when they don't know what's going to happen. So declines prior to shutdowns average about eight to 10%, but once the shutdown is has occurred, the market's already kind of taken that information in. And you can see, based on different shutdowns in this infographic, how the S&P 500 has performed. And really, there, there isn't a massive decline when there's a shutdown. So I guess the, the moral of the story here is that shutdowns cause a lot of volatility because of the uncertainty of whether they are going to occur or not, not so much once they occur. So. Let's shift gears back to how the economy is doing. Um, what, what we're looking at is the economic surprise index. It's, a, it's an index created by Citigroup. It's not so much you know, GDP growth, which last quarter was very, very good, but it's more, this is more a measure of all data points and how those data points look versus what economists expected. So if this if this blue line goes above zero, that means that these data releases are doing better than economists thought. And, and where we are right now, the economy is doing better than was expected to. Recall back in 2022, the Federal Reserve was very aggressive in raising interest rates. And there was a kind of an expectation built into markets that we would see a recession sometime in 2023. Well, that clearly hasn't happened. And the economic indicators have been surprisingly good. Now, as I mentioned before, when I was talking about the cartoon, the Federal Reserve does actually want the economy to slow down. So an economy that's performing surprisingly well can be somewhat of a challenge to bringing down inflation. We have had some positive developments there. And I, I put positive in quotations because they're more negative for the economy. But for the sense of the soft landing narrative, they're positive. So things like a looser jobs market, there have been, uh, there's been a moderation in the number of job quits. So job quits and job starts would, you know, when there's a high level of quits and people are able to start at another job, that's a very loose jobs market. 
we're seeing higher levels of um, uh, people filing for uh, unemployment. So there's been a, a three month high there. So that's that's considered somewhat of a positive as the, as the jobs market maybe isn't as tight as it had been in the past. There are some signs of lower retail spend. I do want to caution that we are coming into the holiday season, which makes you know projections on retail spend spend very difficult. Uh, it could be it could be very disappointing, or it could be blow the doors off. At this point, we're not really sure. And last but not least, there have been some very positive developments with slowing inflation, as we'll see on the next on the next chart. Um, Headline inflation, which came out in mid-November, was only up 3.2%. It was expected to be 3.3%, so it's lower. Core inflation comes in at 4%, and we're looking at core inflation here. That's the red line. It was at 4%. It was expected to be higher than that. Um, in addition to that, later after the CPI numbers came out, producer price index, also called PPI, came out, and that was significantly lower than expected. It grew at 2.4% rather than 2.7%. These are positive surprises for inflation coming down. The chart we're, she we're looking at right now shows you what core inflation looks like, and it also shows you with the blue line where the Fed funds rate is. And you can see that you know, back in 2021, core inflation started to pick up and went to a multi-decade high, and the Fed was behind the curve and has been very aggressive in raising the Fed funds rate. Now it's at a significantly higher level. They want that red line to get to this green line. So they want core inflation to get to 2%. So we're making progress. We're not there yet. There are some possible complications. One is that uh, wages themselves are somewhat sticky. And why is that an issue? Well, we are a service-based economy. So if wages remain elevated, then that means that prices can remain elevated as those wages are passed through on services. I have here onshoring and nearshoring. What is that? Well, after COVID, a lot of companies made a determination that maybe their supply chains were a bit too specialized, a bit too focused in China. So there's been some move by companies to onshore or nearshore some of that production to make it uh, more diversified for their supply chain, higher regulatory costs, things like uh, greenflation, as it's as it's sometimes known, higher environmental standards cause higher costs for companies that they pass through. And last but not least, the big variable is where does consumer spending go? Those will determine whether that red line can get down to that green line. So, looking from a you know from a higher view here the fed funds rate is is around five and a quarter to five and a half percent today uh and the new interest rate regime where I'm, I'm on the next slide as you can see um the policy after the great recession was what we call a zero interest rate policy and it was able to maintain at a, basically a zero percent level because inflation was so muted it was below two percent um it wasn't until more recent history that the Fed tried to raise uh, the interest rate, but COVID put an end to that. You know the rest. Uh, inflation as we came out of COVID started to pick up, so the Fed funds rate has gone higher. We call this the new interest rate regime because it's a contrast with the old one, which was the zero interest rate policy. This is a bit of a different narrative than the soft landing. It is the idea that interest rates will stay higher for longer, and if if the Fed's efforts are complicated by a strong economy, then that would mean that there's a bit of a delay in cutting those interest rates. Now, I think that these two narratives, the soft landing and, a, and a rates higher for longer, I think there's an element of truth to both. I think the economy is slowing down, and I think we are at a point where rates are probably not going to go higher, at least the Fed funds rate is not going to go higher. Really, the devil is in the details of the timing of when rates begin to get cut. And the best at guess right now is sometime in the latter half of 2024. Now, will they ever go back to zero interest rate? Um, that seems very doubtful at this point. So they can go down from here, but still remain elevated versus where they had been in the past. 
I am going to shift gears and move on to talking about the stock market. So what we're looking at are two Morningstar style boxes, and I'll just walk you through really quickly what, what they're telling you. So the, the box on the left is from 2022, and it's showing you the top row are large cap stocks, the middle row mid cap, the bottom small cap. From left to right, you're looking at value stocks, then core or blend stocks, and then growth stocks. So you can see 2022 was, a, was not a very good year for stocks. The only thing that held its own was large cap value. Growth stocks perform particularly poorly. Why is that? Well, when interest rates are going up, investors want to get paid back quicker, and growth stocks tend to be companies that maybe aren't paying you as much today in terms of a return on equity, but they have the potential to pay you back more down the road. Well, when rates go up, people want to get paid back quicker, and so companies that are geared towards paying later suffer, essentially. 2023 is the box on the right, and this data is through October 31st, just so you know. Um, you can see it's been a bit of a different story. Growth has performed better, but it's really been concentrated in large cap growth, which is very tech oriented. And you can see that mid and small cap stocks for both periods of time haven't really participated in this growth. Like I said, it's been very concentrated in one particular area. And I want to note that because as we shift to the next slide, we see that there's been quite a change from the information that we had through October 31st and what we have through the end of November 30th. So if we look at the table in the upper left, we're looking at indexes, this time not by value or core or growth, but by the Russell 1000, which is a large cap index, the Russell mid cap, the Russell 2000 small cap. MSCI, all country world outside the US. Uh, so everything you know international. And then an aggregate bond index. And you can see again that the, the returns in the stock market are very focused on those large cap stocks through Halloween. Well, we had inflation numbers come out in mid-November that were much better than, than people thought they would be. And we had some data releases, uh, jobs numbers, for example, at 150,000, which is below kind of a 200,000 level that people expect. These are these data points are, are pointing to the idea of the economy slowing. Inflation is going in the right direction. This this sounds very much like the soft landing narrative. And you can see that the Russell 1000 large cap, of course, continued on its trajectory going up another, adding another 10% in one month's period of time. But you also see that these other indexes, now, now the expansion is, is including these other categories of stocks. You know, international stocks went from up 1% to up 10%. Um, so you, we're seeing that broaden out in the market, which is a very positive sign. Now, what is this chart down at the bottom? This is a yield curve. So the way to read a yield curve is you start from the left, you look, these are treasuries that are maturing in one month, and then it goes further out as, as maturities get longer so that you, such that you can see a five-year maturity as you go just past the midpoint out to a 10-year maturity, all the way out to 30 years. So what are the interest rates on different treasuries at different times? The blue, the blue line is showing you what interest rates look like on Halloween. The red one is showing you what interest rates look like just after the release of the positive inflation numbers. And you can see that those interest rates went down. Um, this is, again, the, the market saying that they think that interest rates are going to be cut in the future. So interest rates are going to come down. I've noted here the 10-year Treasury yield went from 4.88% in October 31st to a 4.37%. So, you know, more than half a percent move is huge in a 10 year treasury. Why am I citing the 10 year treasury? Well, that's considered a kind of a hallmark longer term uh, yield. So, that's very constructive for stocks. Uh, the 10 year treasury tends to be tied to things like mortgage rates as well. So, again, 
you're going to, you, we've seen some positive move in mortgage rates. Obviously, you know, mortgage rates are a lot higher than they'd ever been for many years, but this is generally considered a very constructive uh, move. So we talked about different market cap strata. What about growth versus value? On the next Greg, slide. Greg, I'm going to interrupt for a quick second. Sorry about okay. that. Just to sure. let everyone know that I'm launching the first poll. So if you're interested in CPE, uh, please respond to the poll on the screen and submit your response. I'll keep it up here for about 30 seconds. All right. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, no problem. All right. So let's talk about growth and value stocks. So this chart is a nice summation of growth versus value in one number. What we're looking at are a basket of stocks that are considered growth stocks, the MSCI All Country World Growth Index. So all growth stocks across the world. And we're comparing it with the MSCI All Country World Value Index, so all value stocks across the world. If, if growth stocks are priced at a certain level, how does that compare with how value stocks are priced? Now, one, one thing to note, growth stocks are always more expensive than value stocks because people are willing to pay more for the earnings growth, but how much more changes over time. So you can see, for example, the late 90s, that was the dot-com bubble. Growth stocks were very expensive versus value stocks, and then that moderated over an extended period of time. Well, look where we are today. We've seen kind of a triple peak in, in the expensiveness of growth versus value. We are still at a level where, where growth stocks are elevated versus value. Two things to take away from that. First is that growth stocks have done very well this year, which makes them more, more expensive relative to value stocks. But on a historical level, growth stocks are very expensive relative to value stocks. So there is some value in having value stocks in your portfolio uh, because they are out of favor and cheap. How does the, the fixed income market look? Well, the next slide showing you, this looks confusing, but it's really not. This is showing you year to date returns across different categories of fixed income. So I want to highlight just a couple of different areas here. All of these charts start at zero because you know you start the year, you don't have any return yet. Look at the bottom line, that's treasury bonds. These are the longest maturity bonds among treasuries. Um, if you've learned anything about fixed income investing, you know that bond prices go down when interest rates go up. So from the beginning of the year to the point we are at today, interest rates are higher than they were at the beginning of the year. So those rates have gone up. Well, treasury bonds have not performed well. You can see they've moved into kind of a or the red zone where they're, you know, below 10% year to date performance. Contrast that, for example, with, uh, you know, and, and different categories here haven't done very well. A couple that have corporate high yields have done pretty well. They've, they've, they've held their own among bonds. That's because they tend to be a bit of an equity surrogate because they are uh, more focused on credit risk. Uh, I do want to point out treasury bills, which is more in the middle of the chart. You can see you start at zero and it just moves nice and smoothly, gets a positive return. As we, we showed you in that uh, yield curve, short term rates are among the highest rates out of all maturities. So treasury bills are yielding somewhere around 5.3, 5.4%, and you just keep earning interest on that. Um, it's behaving somewhat a lot like cash or a money market fund. So you're, you're just continuing to generate a positive return over time. But I do want to caution investors on the next slide. Th there's a bit of caution about cash. So what are the odds of cash outperforming stocks in any one given year? About 31%. In other words, about 69% of the time stocks will outperform cash. So there is some comfort in having cash because in today's world, cash is yielding something positive, something above inflation. It's offering a real return. But as you extend out your time frame, your, your odds of outperforming stocks becomes lower and lower over a long period of time. So cash isn't really a, a great place to put your money for a long term. It is a great place if, if you need liquidity to have your money, especially right now when rates are higher.
I do want to cover on the next slide the idea of uh, the different different categories of investments. So that this is a very colorful slide, as you you can no doubt see. But what it's showing you is kind of a ranking of different asset classes over time. And if you start at the left, you look at the year 2012, and then we show you each column as a different year. And the different colors correspond to different asset classes. So if you're at the top, you perform the best in that year. And as you can see, for example, in 2012, international emerging stocks perform better than any other category. Uh, in recent history, among uh, the year to date, all the way out on the right, large cap U.S. stocks have performed the best. What's the key takeaway here? It's that you should be diversified across different asset classes because leadership from one year to the next changes. And you don't know exactly which category is going to be uh, a leader from year to year. So you want to maintain a diversified portfolio. I am going to close with my final slide, which is to, to offer you some top ideas. And the first one is tax loss harvesting. So if you have uh, assets in a taxable account and you have and your mileage may vary depending on what's in your portfolio, you may have taken most of your tax losses last year. But if you have some, consider harvesting those losses so that they can count towards offsetting some of your capital gains in the current year. So you, what you're doing is you're, you're, if you have something at a net loss, you're selling it. If you can, you purchase something that's a similar security. Uh, sometimes that can be difficult, especially if it's a small cap stock. There's not a lot of equivalence to individual small cap securities, but it's, it's something that you want to consider. I have here potential areas would be small caps and high dividend equity. Uh, that's simply because those haven't participated in the same way as other stocks, but again, your mileage may vary depending on when you bought the securities. Consider adding duration to your bonds. So we just talked about how short-term rates are higher than long-term rates, but the directionality of longer-term rates has been going down, which is positive for stocks. So if you've been very focused on the short-term, it might be time to add a little bit of uh, duration or as we call it maturity uh, in your bond portfolio. Small cap, uh, small value has a lot of value. It hasn't participated the same way as other stocks in the stock market. So consider, you know, if, if value is undervalued versus growth and small caps haven't participated, then small cap value may be an area to uh, consider adding to your portfolio. And consider the tax implications of your portfolio. For securities that have high growth potential, you want to keep them in tax advantaged accounts. So in other words, an IRA. Uh, the, you know, if you've heard the, uh, there's a, a, a slogan, I think, for Vegas, which is what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens in your IRA stays in your IRA. So if you have a lot of capital gains in your IRA, you can sell with without worrying about realizing any kind of capital gains. So the moral of the story is put your highest growth ideas, highest growth potential ideas in those tax advantage portfolios. And last but not least, Make sure you take required minimum distributions if you are required to take them out of your IRA before year end. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Richard. Richard, before you get started, I'm just going to launch the second poll, which will be up on the screen for about 30 seconds. So please respond if you're interested in CPE. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, as we wrap up the year, it's important to take a look at your, your tax and financial and investment plans. And part of that's looking back at what the impact of various legislation has been during the year. And there's really two things that are coming in, uh, really into effect in 23 uh, and 24. And one of them uh, is the uh, Corporate Transparency Act of 21. Um, the other one is the Secure Act 2.0, which we're gonna have to go back and see what 1.0 was. Um, but this Corporate Transparency Act applies to really any business organized in the United States, um, whether for profit or not for profit. And and it's part of this anti money laundering. Regiment, um, which is why you report to the uh, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. That's what FinCEN is. Um, and basically you have to for certain corporate structures, you have to 
list who the beneficial owners are. Um, you know, if Greg and I form a partnership called the Richard and Greg Partnership, it's pretty obvious who they are. If we form one, two, three corp, it's not as obvious. So that's where the money laundering part goes into it. Um, the good news is if you are already in existence by New Year's Day <clears throat> 24, you have until you have a full year to report. Um, if you're formed or changed at some point during 24, you have 30 days to respond to it, to file an update as your new ownership. Um, and the penalties are pretty onerous, $500 a day. Um, so it's something you'll see a lot about if you haven't already heard about that. Um, as far as individual side, the SECURE Act of, of uh, 2.0 of 22, um, it's about securing a re retirement for everyone. Um, there are changes in the required minimum distributions, what we call catch-ups. Roths get touched on this. Education gets touched on this. Um, pretty much changes most of the retirement rules as you knew them, or many of them, uh, going forward. So before we get talk 2.0, let's talk 1.0. Um, and this sort of happened right before COVID, and so COVID delayed to 1.0 and 2.0. So, you know, why are we talking about something that happened four years ago? Um, one of the big changes is it pushed back the required minimum distribution date. So, long story short, when you put money into a retirement plan, normally you get a reduction in your taxable income. You put money in your 401k, it reduces your taxes. You put money into an individual retirement arrangement, normally that reduces your taxable income. So, the government, those are growing tax free all this time, which is great. Um, and when you ultimately pull it out, it gets taxed. But the government only wants to wait so long. So they, they set these required minimum distribution dates, which started at 70 and a half, one of the odder parts of tax law. Um, so they pushed that back and said, eh, people are living longer anyway. We'll push it back to 72, the beginning date. This is 1.0. But then it also changed the rules. So it used to be um, if you left, well, let me step back even prior to the uh, 1.0. These required distributions are based upon the IRS's life expectancy tables. So they have these tables, regards to your health situation and everything, that you're gonna live a certain number of years. And so that's what you divide this by. Um, so under the previous law, what you could do is, is if someone passed away, you know, a 90 year old parent leads it to a 64 year old child, then that child would pay it out over their life expectancy. So that could be another 24 years. So we had a 90 year old, then we're getting another 24 year old. It's equivalent of like a you know, 114 year old. But then if they left it to like a grandchild who was let's say 43, it's another 43 years. So and we're sort of not looking to have that stretch going on anymore. The government decided we, we're willing to be generous to a point. So it said for non surviving spouse, for anyone other than a surviving spouse, Basically, you're going to get 10 years, and we'll talk about that. Um, you're going to get 10 years to pay it out. So even if you leave it to a, you know, 20-something, 30-something grandchild, you've essentially got 10 years to pay it out. But there was also a little thing in there for 529 plans. It says, you know, you could take from a 529 plan um, and, and use it for student loan repayment, uh, and that would be one of the qualified uses of that. So that's sort of interesting. Um, and then the Secure Act 2.0 came. It was like 2.0, more than 1.0, it's supposed to be improved. And, and again, it pushed the dates farther back. Okay, the required minimum issues then would start, you know, age 73, age, you know, depending on when your birth date is, 73, 74, 75. But it also changed the penalty regimen. So it used to be that if you didn't take um, the distribution, there was a penalty equal to 50% of the amount you didn't take. So if there's $10,000 you didn't take, a penalty was $5,000, plus you pay tax on what came, what comes out. So 2.0 said, all right, well, that's still a little onerous. We want people to do it. So now if you miss it, it'll be taxed at 25% rather than this penalty, regardless of your rate. Um, or if you correct it in time, it gets dropped to a 10% rate. So again, trying to encourage people to pull that money out um, and, and put it into use. Um, and so this 10-year window, of course, has some, some details to that. If, if the decedent had started taking their RMDs, required, you would continue it through nine years as if you were on their schedule. 
So as if you were still the 90 year old in that example. And then by year 10, you'd have to take it out. If you hadn't started that, then you would have to have it all out by the end of the 10th year. So while it covered what has to come out, it also changed what could go in. Uh, there are already some existing what they're called catch up contributions, which people get to age 50 and realize they may not have put enough money away. So there's certain amounts you could, even in their existing law, you could put in an additional amount as, as a 50 or older to catch up. So it's been $1,000 for a while. So now it's going to go up to up to 24. Uh, up to 2500 a year over a four year period. So that gets another $10,000 in there. Um, so if, if you make too much, which is a certain amount the government has said in there, $145,000, then you're not going to get a deduction for it. It goes into what's called a Roth. And a Roth is a retirement account. It's named for, I think he was a congressman Roth. Um, and you don't get a deduction when it goes in. So there's no current tax benefit. But when you pull it out, it's tax free. So, of course, we all want to have some tax free money. So if you make over 145, that amount has to go into what's called a Roth, which is you don't get a current deduction, but it's going to grow tax free. Um, so since it's federal law, all these plans have to comply. So your employer may or may not be current with that. Most are, according to you know Fidelity and these other surveys that they do. But that is a, a quirk uh, to that they can't control. Um, now it also touches, you know, 529 plans. So 529, it's it's the section of the Internal Revenue Code. There's no great significance to it. Um, it's starting next year, so starting next month. Um, beneficiaries of a 529 plan can actually roll money into a retirement account. So you can roll up to $35,000 into a retirement account. Um, now this is a pretty <clears throat> It's a pretty tough needle to thread because um, it's really it's over a number of years. So it's up to the Roth IRA contribution. So it'd be seven thousand a year. So you say, OK, they could take me five years to do that. Um, you must have some earned income, at least go to what you're rolling over. You can do it up to a certain amount, which right now is thirty five thousand dollars. And the account has to been open at least 15 years. So. You know, again, it's a, it's probably a small cadre if you apply to, but it does it does eliminate some of the overfunding concerns. You know, people come to us and go, well, "What if I, what if I have money left over? What if my child gets a full ride?" That's a good problem to have. Um, but this addresses some of that and says, you know, and, and it proves the versatility of the five twenty nine plans as well. So, you know, for the if it fits in, it, it's a great opportunity to worry about you know the overfunding because then otherwise at some point the five twenty nines would otherwise have to be paid out. And then those are taxed. Uh, but continuing on the on the on the Roth thread, um, there's some changes to what are called simplified employee pension plans, SEPs, and simple plans. Basically, those are plans set up for self-employed individuals, small businesses. So it's not your 401ks and your 413ps. Um, and you know, just as of now, there there are ways you can you can in essence you know double dip with a Roth and simple, just like you can do it now with a regular IRA and a simple. So it it, it matches them up for a similar treatment. And that that begins uh, in 23. So that actually began this year. So there's changes. Again, it's sort of the, the, the there's this focus for the government for a number of years is, OK, you need to put more of your own money away. There's only so much Social Security. So that's why the, the 401k rules, those were all broadened. Um, that's probably about 15 years ago now. Um, and now you see the same movement towards Roths as well. Now, also, there is a retirement portion that affects charitable giving um, to a, what's a, a qualified charitable distribution. So what is a qualified charity? The short answer is it's it's your your 501c3. So it's the you know, United Ways. It's all those those charities that you know, those public charities that exist for the public good. Um, there's actually a government website you can check and see whether your, your charities qualify. Um, but but there's a provision that says, OK, you can take um, from your retirement account directly to a charity um, and make up to $100,000, transfer up to $100,000 a year, not pick it up in income, and not get the deduction. 
if you, you know, meet the age requirements and those things. So why would you want to do that? Why would I not want to take a deduction? Deductions, we told you people fears. Deductions are always good. Um, deductions are often good. Um, but but when you take them in income, it pushes up the, the income level that a lot of other limitations are triggered off of, what's called your adjusting gross income. So if you don't have to pick it up in income, it may actually be saving you more tax on a couple levels than that deduction would otherwise do for you. So again, it is consult with your local advisor, but that it is in oftentimes for high income individuals, it is more advantageous to make the contribution directly from the retirement account to the uh, qualified charity. And that's what's called a QCD. Um, and if you're already taking your, your RMDs, um, you've probably been notified by, by the um, trustee of that. So those are really the two big pieces of legislation that that you're going to hear a lot about, which is this um, the Corporate Transparency Act and then the Secure Act 2.0. Um, but there's a number of other provisions that that expire uh, or just aren't renewed at different times. Um, alternative fuels credit, you know, again, that's for for certain specific types of of fuels as opposed to your basic gasoline and diesel you're pouring in there. Um, but also there was a limitation coming out of some of the um, and the Inflation Reduction Act, which it used to be if if you were you know in a in a business self-employed in a partnership and you lost a million dollars, um, well, sort of the good news was from a tax point of view you could deduct that million dollars against all your other income. Um, well, now we have what are called excess limitations. So there's a certain limit of how much you can take. So if you're a married couple. You know, you lost more than five hundred seventy-eight thousand dollars this year. You can only claim five hundred seventy-eight, and then the balance rolled forward. Okay, so that when that came in, that caught a number of people unaware. Is just because it's it's different to to again, sort of how the income has been taxed for for generations and generations. So you don't lose it; it is deferred if you are over that. And and those numbers are half as high for um, uh, single taxpayers. Um, employee retention credit, you've probably heard all those commercials on the radio. That tells you that something has has reached peak and, and has jumped the shark. Um, that all went away. Um, and there were myriad abuses, so much so that the IRS has said, you know what? If you've, you know, if you're having a, you know, a, attack of conscience or whatever, you can withdraw them. No questions asked. Because when you filed these employee retention credit claims, it changed a lot of returns. Okay, when you when you did that, it would change the business return, would change your individual return, um, and there were some less than scrupulous preparers out there pushing these things. Um, so what the service said is, you know what, we're going to let you people um, pull them back. It's complicated. There may have been some abuses. Um, so it and there's a procedure for for doing that. Um, the other one is what you may have heard of this 1099k. Um, the Post, the Journal, everybody's reporting on that, um, which is if you had more than $600 from, you know, PayPal, Venmo, I know all these cash apps, you were going to get a statement. You were going to get like a little 10 9 link you always get. And it would say, um, you know, Richard Morris got $650 from Venmo. And the presumption is that that's taxable income. Well, probably not. And, and for your kids, the number's way higher. Um, you know, you're splitting tickets, getting reimbursed for meals, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and the reporting requirement would have been, I think, 43 million returns. So it was changed to uh, $20,000 worth of uh, transactions and at least more than 200 transactions during the year. Um, there's a push to get rid of it completely, but but that's the 23 amount. And then it's scheduled to be $5,000 for next year. But but stay tuned. I mean, it is in many ways um, a, a nuisance filing. Another thing for businesses uh, is this bonus depreciation. And, and, and the idea basically was for a period, you could write off 100% of certain assets you put in, you put in, you put in service as a business. Um, well, it's slowly waterfalling away. So in 23, for example, it fell to 80%. Of, so if you put you know, a, a hundred thousand dollar piece of technology in place. You know, seventeen through twenty two, you could write off that whole hundred thousand. Whereas this year, you would write off eighty thousand and then depreciate the other twenty thousand. And so that is slowly going away. Um, there was a provision 
uh, during COVID where you could defer payment of half your social security taxes, um, that expired at the end of 22. Um, the big 2017 tax act, uh, people call it the Trump tax cut, the formal name, the, the, the um, tax, uh, tax Cuts and Jobs Act of, of 2017 expires um, in, in 24 months, expires at the end of 2025. And that's got you know, income tax where your your salt taxes and and all the the higher um, the higher floors uh, as well as the estate tax. So there is there is a lot that potentially um, changes at the end of 2025. But we do have a presidential election coming up, and usually the the first term or the second term um, of a president there is there is usually pretty substantial tax policy at least going back to the going back to the 80s. Um, so now we can touch on some inflation adjustments. Um, and, and these are the limits for the different types of plans. 401k, 403b is the same thing. It's just really if you're if you're in a not-for-profit. Um, there were really dramatic increases last year because of inflation. But to Greg's slides, inflation really was, was, uh, was less this year. So the contribution limits have come down, have not increased by nearly as much as they had. Um, in the prior year. Clean vehicle credits, there's a lot on here. And really that's to convey just how confusing this is. Um, again, it's a push to get people to buy American made and sourced electric vehicles. And you can get up to $7,500 of credits as opposed to a deduction. And that's if you don't make too much. So the short version is this, is, is again, there is a website that lists the vehicle because you'd hate to go and purchase one of these vehicles and then find out, ooh, it doesn't really qualify. Um, the list is growing, but it is not It is not a great number of them that qualify for that. Richard, I'm going to just launch the third poll here, if you don't mind. I'll have it up sure. on the screen for about 30 seconds. Sure. Um, and how much is too much? Um, Mary filing jointly, 300000 is too much. Um, and then it also gets to the price of the vehicle. Um, and if you have looked at this or just been curious, um, a, a, a truck, SUVs, most of them seem to be SUVs, below 80,000, cars below 55. There's a couple models that fit in that. So again, it's a, um, it, it's a, it could be a tight needle to thread. So the year's not quite over. So there's still time to look at your withholdings, estimated payments that you've made. Um, there weren't big changes in the withholding tables this year, so there won't be necessarily the surprises that there were last year. But again, you want to look and see if you had any unusual or non-recurring items in, in either 22 or 23 that can skew the picture one way or another. Um, the fourth quarter estimates really aren't due until January 15th. Uh, before the SALT tax limit came in, we used to, you know, it was advantageous to make those state payments by December 31. It's really not anymore. Um, it comes down to cash management. Um, you know, two things, we always look to avoid surprises. Um, and then also, I mean, there are penalties if you don't meet it. Um, so it, it's often time to save yourself some money by having a, a review before you're in, just to see where you are relative to um, where you think you've been. This is just showing the, the brackets, um, and these are available, our website, many other places. Um, there are seven brackets. I mean, these these would change, and, and all of these numbers would be higher if things fall back to where they were prior to the 2017 jobs cut out. So there'd be no 10%. 37 would be 39 and change, um, and these, these steps would be substantially lower amounts. So... Um, you know, the equivalent of this 24% bracket would have been in about $80,000 under the under the prior regime. So that's just to give you an idea. The slides will be available. Um, but just if you're ever trying to figure out what bracket do I fall in, this gives you a pretty good idea. Uh, dividends and capital gains rates, if they qualify, again, there's minor inflation adjustments, inflationary adjustments here. But but really, the key part of this is a 0%. So if your taxable income is up to these numbers here, your long-term capital gains and dividends would be taxed at 0%. If you're in this range, they would only be taxed at a maximum 
not a not a flat of 15 percent and 20 so that's an interesting an interesting quirk in the law again um which was years ago said you know we probably want to promote capital activity and so that's that that does exist so it is possible to see a lower tax rate than you thought uh one of the changes of 17 was the standard deductions were dramatic I mean, they're about four times what they were before so if you're an individual it's almost fourteen thousand dollars so it, it took a lot of people out of out of itemizing i mean a super majority of americans do not um itemize uh state of maryland leads the country in percentage of itemizers um so you, you see the numbers there 13850 2800 277 so if your itemized deductions don't exceed that this is more advantageous from a federal point of view um and for people in maryland new jersey sort of all the coastal states um well everybody's taxed at ten thousand dollars of state taxes whereas you know then that's that's income and real estate so if you were God bless you. If you were very successful, you could have, you know, tens, hundreds of thousand of dollars of state taxes that you would have as an itemized deduction. Um, in reality, you lost them on the alternative minimum tax. But in theory, you had all these deductions that you're losing. So if you're a married couple now and your state taxes are capped at ten thousand dollars, you need to come up with with, you know, seventeen thousand seven hundred dollars of you know, essentially charitable and, and, and medical, you know, for most people. Um, um, charitable medical and, and and mortgage interest or investment interest. Uh, so that's why a lot of people end up, oh shoot, I'll just take the standard deduction. The problem is the st generally if you take the standard deduction on the federal, you take the standard deduction uh, on your state taxes. Um, and for many of the states, it's a fraction. It's a fraction of that. Um, so for Maryland, um, it's 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 not five thousand dollars for a couple. And then in Virginia, it's closer. It's about seventeen thousand. So, you know, prudent preparers always compare that and say, look, we're maybe giving up a little bit on the federal side, but we'll get it back on the on the state side. So, for example, let's say your your itemized deductions come to twenty thousand dollars for um, you know under the federal rules. Well, maybe on on your Maryland return, it's worth it because you're getting another, you know, you're getting another fifteen thousand dollars at you know eight percent. So I mean, there's there there's math involved, um, but it's not it's not a uh, it's not a definitive that okay, we're always going to take the 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 standards because they're higher than what my itemized uh, could be because you got to look at the state implications of that as well, you know. And we are are you know, in a jurisdiction where there's three very different ones uh, right outside our doors. Um, state and local, really the thing I'm going to touch on here is, is um, the SALT tax we've talked about, which again limited the amount of state and local taxes you could claim. Um, if you live in a state uh, with high real estate and or a high um, personal income tax rate, it can be you know serious money that you are losing, which is why you would hear often in these bills, you know, the delegation from New York, New Jersey, Connecticut are pushing to have this lifted. Um, so related to that is this, this what's called PTE tax, pass through entities, whereas partnerships and S-corps can sort of pay your share of tax on it. Think of it sort of as the equivalent of withholding on a business end to get around the salt limit. So that's why you had a lot of changes on the state levels. And some states have handled it okay. Some states have handled it really badly. Um, so if you got a notice, let's say from the state of Maryland, that that there's a problem with your return and there and you're you know uh you know you're an attorney you're in you're in some um partnership for example it's probably related to the state hasn't caught up with the processing and they put out a notice this fall which we reposted that basically said uh the comptroller of maryland said well this is a lot of stuff to process um give us time but we think we're going to have it worked out in in you know 20 months or something um I'm going to touch on something that's really unchanged, and, and I'll do it quickly. But just for charitable contributions, um, it's fallen back from the pandemic of of 100% of AGI. Now it's 50%. Um, but for all your non-cash stuff, bulls and bears survive and pigs get slaughtered. It just be prudent. You know, look at a look at a you know Salvation Army website or Goodwill what you're valuing this stuff at. It doesn't matter that you paid a thousand dollars for that suit. Nobody's going to pay a fraction of that at one of these thrift shop stores. So it's really 
thrift shop value, which means it's good or better condition. Don't get caught up for, for a few bucks on that, but also consider bunching them and, and maybe doing them every other year, you know, because we talked about not being able to itemize. Maybe you make your contributions every two years and you, you bundle them together. Um, and something else that hasn't changed that people sort of forget about until they see their tax return is in addition to all your income tax rates and everything they went down, is there still this additional uh, tax on certain types of income, uh, certain I don't know, unearned income? Um, although some would argue that that you know their their rental activity and and other things are are earned, but the government puts another three point eight percent tax on top of that. And again, that's if your income falls above one of these one of these limits cited on here. So even if you're only at a thirty percent bracket. You could have this other 3.8% um, uh, tax on top of that. Richard, excuse me. Let me interrupt you one final time. Yeah. I am going to launch the final CPE poll in just a moment. But uh, regardless of whether you're going for CPE or not, I'm publishing now in the chat box a link to a short feedback survey. If you wouldn't mind taking a moment or two of your time to let us know your thoughts about today's webinar. Uh, we would really appreciate it. And like I said uh, at the beginning of the webinar, uh, this does impact our future programming. So uh, thank you so much. Um, okay, I'm going to touch on, on estate tax and crypto really quickly so we can get to credits. Um, these are adjusted for inflation. Um, again, this this is scheduled to sunset at the end of 25. So you don't, you know, if and which means sunset means it falls back to about six million dollars per. Um, so if you are in a position where this makes a difference, you want to you want to get your planning done in the next, you know, in the next 23 months or so to make sure you take advantage of it. Um, nobody knows nobody knows whether it's going to sunset or not. It's scheduled to sunset. Nobody knows what extensions or changes might happen. So. Of course, better to be prudent than be sorry. Um, but the state exemptions are nowhere near these federal amounts. Okay, the federal amount, you know, 13 million for discussion purposes. Maryland at five, DC at four and a half, uh, Virginia at zero. So um, so again, if you think, well, I've only got a number less than the federal, depending upon where you live, there could be some taxes on that too. Crypto. You know, once a month you pick up the paper and somebody's going to jail or paying some fine for ripping people off through some crypto scheme. Um, Iris ramped up reporting last year, and there's a specific question on there that basically says, did you or did you not have any digital asset transactions? OK, pretty blunt, pretty blunt, pretty blunt. Um, think really hard before you give an answer to that. Um, and basically it's any transactions. Think of it as, as if for tax purposes. Not legal purposes for tax purposes, as if it's any other security that you've owned, you know, a share of stock, a bond, or something like that. So gains and losses. Um, it's not too late to go back and amend old returns if you may didn't realize that they could have been taxable back then. Um, but this is this is a, an increasing point of emphasis on them. And again, there are story upon stories of of things going on there, which means people want to take losses. So it's going to be hard to claim a loss in 23 when for years you've said, wait, I have no. I have no crypto transactions. However, I just lost two hundred thousand dollars in crypto. So again, let's not uh, let's be prudent about this. Um, last thing here is it's you know again inflation adjustments. Um, you know, certain mile the the the, the travel miles changes. Uh, the other ones don't because they're they are set at the federal level. So. Really, you know, they're they're still saying there there's opportunity and complexity, um, it, and that's where we you know we try to look and see what what all the what all the factors are that contribute to your taxation, and some of it can be literally the form that you're doing business or conducting your affairs or, or you know however that might be, um, but I mean it, it's you know if if I do it it's a loophole, if you do it it's a planning opportunity, it's the same thing. It depends on on where you sit when you say that. Um, uh, but our our role is to help you you coordinate all that your financial and your tax planning and, your, and all that matters your estate, um, and and that's the role we fit in is to is to talk with everybody and to coordinate all that. Um, so with that, I'm going to see because I know we're bumping up against the number. Um, if people want to stick around, we can go through some questions that were in the chat. Um, 
I don't have that up on another screen. It's one of you. I, I know. Do you, uh, Richard, do you want me to go ahead and just start asking you some questions? Yeah, absolutely. We've, we've got quite a few. Um, so I, I, I'll start with some that were asked initially. Are there um, are there new rules or changes that affect self-employed 1099 contractor? Uh, so there's always the, the retirement account limits change for that. Um, in terms of the amount you can claim as a deduction that always gets adjusted for inflation. Um, if you're using any sort of assets that you'll be taking depreciation on, those bonus rules are slowly um, compressing that a little bit. Um, so those are probably the two that jump to mind right away. Um, how do you deduct short-term capital losses? Um, so short-term capital losses uh, would go against short-term capital gains, then would go against long-term capital gains. Um, and to the extent you have more losses than gains, you can claim up to 3,000 of those against the rest of your income. And then if anything more than that carries forward in the subsequent years. So if I lose $10,000 um, by not calling Greg and I have no other no other trading, act, you know, no other capital gains or losses, I can take 3,000 this year and then the balance carries forward and carries forward and carries forward. Now, you you may have, I, I saw you touched on pass-through entities and you may have answered this, but are there upcoming changes in taxation on pass-through entities? Um, there are not. Uh, there, there, there's at this point, I mean, a lot of it is hinges on what happens with this this tax cut and jobs act um, going forward? Um, I mean, and, and you know, all all tax legislation originates and and ends in the Congress. So, regardless of what your politics are, not a lot's going on. So, the idea of anything sweeping happening um, would be pretty slim. There there are a couple of investment ones that I'm going to go ahead and answer. The first is what is your forecast for the markets in the first half of 2024? And then uh, another one on thoughts on the mortgage rate crisis created to slow down the economy by raising federal rates. Uh, what was going so wrong, in your opinion, with the housing market that it needed to be artificially stagnated? Well, um, I guess I'll answer the, the second one first. Um, I think the housing market is actually is a casualty of uh, it, it, it wasn't policy on interest rates was not set to to specifically address housing. It was it was set because uh, the Federal Reserve had gotten so far behind the eight ball with with inflation. And one of their biggest concerns about not maintaining price stability is, well, you can kind of see the results in countries that that have big inflation problems, and that is uh, civil unrest. So um, the the idea of of raising interest rates was was done to bring down inflation. Unfortunately, the instrument is not a laser; it's not a scalpel; it's a hammer. And so, when you're operating on a patient, uh, you're going to do damage to other parts of the body. So, uh, obviously, uh, mortgage rates are are much higher than they've been in many years. They've come down maybe half a percent, I think, in recent history. Um, but, you know, you, you have sellers don't want to sell because they, you know, they they can't they can't find their another house to replace the one they have. And their, their mortgage rate is fantastic. And why why go into a higher rate? Um, and then buyers aren't really interested in buying. So it, it's pretty much completely seized the market. Uh, what is my forecast for markets in the first half of 2024? Well, um, I'm, I would expect it to be kind of choppy. We've had very strong results over the last month. Um, those results are so strong that they don't tend to, uh, bodies don't tend to stay in motion in investing. Um, there's more of a reversion to the mean. So I would expect there to be more volatility, but depending on the trajectory of, of inflation, we could still see, even with that volatility, uh, I think there's the news has been constructive for stock prices. So I'm generally positive on on what could happen there. Uh, let's see. I have, and I think this, Richard, this looks like a, an excellent question for you. Um, I have multiple accounts, international and domestic. I'm not sure what to prepare for a tax agent. Do you have any advice for this person? 
Uh, that's a great question. So we, we talked about the fi Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN. Um, so there are already existing um, reporting rules for foreign accounts that you own. There's a there's another whole form um, that you're required to file to give um, essentially name and address of the account where you hold it. I mean, there's 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 a couple, and there's also an IRS 8938 form. But basically, if you have over a certain amount, you you literally would list, um, you know, first Bank of Scotland. You know, one, two, three, whatever street, da, 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 account number and amount. I mean, it it is very, you know, this all goes back to the laundering stuff. Um, it is very specific. It is very specific. Um, so the 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 shorter answer is uh, let's go ahead and comply and, and, it, and it saves a lot of trouble down the road. Um, but also, if you have those accounts, they're probably earning interest or something on them. So we want to make sure we're picking up the interest on that as well uh, on that. Uh, because the question would be, well, Mr. Morris, you had $300,000 of cash sitting in an offshore account. Why didn't it earn any interest? So. OK, um, can I run multiple SEP IRAs, rate Roth and regular, and take advantages of each? So if, if I'm hearing the question right, it's if the limit's $7,000, can I open a lot of accounts? Um, and the short answer is no. The limit is per taxpayer, so you can open multiple accounts, but the contribution limits are at a a per tax uh, per taxpayer uh, basis. I hope that answers the question. Uh, what, Richard? What are the tax advantages of giving larger gifts this tax year? Um. If, if I, I briefly touched on this concept of bunching, which, you know, these standard deductions are so great. Um, of course, we want to give to charity, but it'd be really nice if we get a deduction for it on top of it. So is that you make those contributions every other year. So you would you would uh, aggregate them and say, OK, you know, 23 is going to be our year. So we won't make them in 24. So we'll pull them into this year so we can get the benefit of them. Because um, if you're going to itemize, you would get the benefit at the state level, too. Um, uh, I mean, if you have a super, you know, liquidity event, you can do something called a, a donor advised fund, a DAF, um, and you can put a, a ton of money into it, um, but you don't have to designate the charities till later. So, um, you know, short version, you win the lottery, uh, you know, you sell your business and, and you get big money. Um, well, we know that those charitable contributions are limited to a percentage of income. And if I intend to be really generous for the rest of my life, but I'm not making as much money in those years, I'm not going to get the benefit of it. So a donor advised fund lets you put a large amount of money away uh, in a charitable fund. You get the deduction this year to offset this year's income, and then you can still dole it out to um, recognize charities going forward. Uh, let's see here. I've got a few more. Um, if I am filing as single, how much in deductions do I need to itemize? My home property taxes are 9,000. Can I make up the rest of the deductions to itemize with cash gift to Fidelity Charitable? Great question. So the, the state and local limits only five. Um, so then the question is, all right, um, on, the, on the slide we showed the 13850. Um, do, 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 do. So, I've, all right, I've got five of state and local. And then the question is can I get to 8850 through charity, mortgage interest, um, well, actually, investment interest, um, you know, possibly medical if, if that's a situation. Um, but I mean, that's the, that's the hurdle to get to for just the federal purposes. And it depends on, on your state. And that's where you sort of got to do the math to figure out, you know, I'm giving up a few points on the federal side, but I'm getting a lot on the state side. All right, I think we have just a, just a couple more. And this one's kind of a, I think, a big picture question, but how do I decide whether to do a Roth conversion? That is a, um, that's you, you, you make a phone call and we sit down and run some analysis. It depends on a lot of factors. It depends on a lot of factors. One, 
I mean, the basic thing is when you do a Roth, it comes into income. So it comes on top of everything else you have. So it's probably going to be top bracket numbers. So an opportunity to do a Roth is, let's say you have one of these losses that I talked about. Well, you, this will suck up the loss. Um, uh, so you can, in essence, then do a conversion you know, tax-free. Um, but then there's also... You know, some uh, from just a, a financial and accounting point of view. You know, are there other streams of 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 revenue for when you're retired? There's a lot of factors that go into it. So there's no um, there's no cookie cutter answer, and it depends on um, what other assets you have, your your income situation, um, uh, current and then future as well. Uh, but sometimes it's good to do it as an estate tool, which is and have a clients do it. Say, look, I you know I don't need this money anyway. It's going to go to my kids, at least this way, if I can pay the tax for them on it, I'm willing to do that. So there are there are situations where it's advantageous to do it because it also reduces your estate tax, strangely enough, because you're going to use money to pay the taxes on that. So um, it's, you know, one of the most complicated financial decisions, but it's a matter of sort of walking through the decision tree. Uh, we got we got one in the chat, and it's can you set aside in both 401k and Roth at their respective maximum for the year? For example, 225 401k, and for Roth 6500 for a total of 29,000. Depends on your income limit. So it it is possible. Um, um, it is possible to do. I guess we talked about sort of the interplay among the the various limitations um, to be able to do that. Because again, the encouragement is for people to put their own money away. I did. I did see a one comment. It's. It's. It seems like it's more of a comment, but uh, it was about. It was about life expectancy um, mm -hmm. because you know they've extended. You know the re when you take your required minimum distribution. Right. And the person mentioned that life expectancy in the U.S. is going in the opposite direction. I, I'm assuming that's more recent history on that data. Uh, I wonder if this will change yet again. And I think he means that you know that the the calculations or the the rules that they put in place for when you take your RMD, if life expectancy were to start shortening, whether they would force people to start taking the RMD sooner or not. Um, that's. I think I think the big picture is that life expectancy over a longer haul has been getting longer. Maybe in the short term, there's been some noise, particularly around COVID, uh, with with shorter life expectancy numbers. Oh no! I mean, the, the genius of Social Security when it was established was um, the date of payout. The the reason they chose 65 is because that was life expectancy. So it's like, hey, if you live past the day, you know, so. If that were adjusted for life expectancy, that would be, I think it's 77 or so for women. Um, you know, that that's going the other way. So these, you know, once once sort of that got set in stone, that got set in stone. So that never changes. Um, uh, but the other the other tables, I mean, they're not actuarially determined. I mean, the IRS determined these these uh, life expectancy tables years ago. I don't believe mean, they changed. Uh, they may have changed around the millennium. But yeah, that's a great um, that's a great philosophical question. Well, I think I think that's everything. Um, I don't appear to have any. We don't appear to have any other questions. Yeah, and actually, one just I wanted, I wanted to jump in on your on your point before about inflation. If you look, people under probably age forty really have no recollection of of inflation. So, I mean, that's why it was so, I mean, it's always unnerving. I think that's why it was so unnerving to, to all those people. Because if you figure, I you know, and, you know, the inflation that ravaged late 60s into the early 80s, it was pretty much done by 84. So, you know, as a two and three year old, you're not, you're not checking grocery store prices. So for, you know, roughly around age 40, you would, you would agree? I mean, age 40 or so, you have no concept of. Well, and you're right. It was, it, this inflation uh, level reached a multi-decade high because, you know, it had been since the early 80s that we had that kind of inflation yeah. rate. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. Um, but no, thank you. I mean, it's, it's um, you know, on a legislative side, this was sort of a quiet year, but 
but presidential election, you know, the, the years following a presidential election tend to be active. So, um, you know, there's minor acts that come along, but there's no anticipation at this point of something big to happen in 24, but certainly in 25. So stay tuned. All right. Well, I think that that about wraps it up. I'm just going to cut to our slide of our last few as, as, as people log off. Um, our, our next upcoming presentations, it's on our website as well. Um, so you're welcome to, to hang on to any of those. You can you can register one more in December and then January and, and February as well, separate from the market updates that that MBI does. You good? Thank you, everybody. All right, thank you.